diabetes and blood pressure coexist together. The connection between hypertension and diabetes has now been revealed thanks to new scientific evidence. Is excessive salt intake and weight gain to be blamed? Today, you will know and understand the underlying mechanism behind both conditions. Many diabetics have been given the wrong treatment for decades, which only aggravates both conditions concurrently. Once armed with today's knowledge, many of you could have the possibility of simultaneously reversing both your diabetes and high blood pressure while becoming drug free. How amazing is that? But before we begin, let me welcome all of you resilient diabetics out there. This is the channel we turn ordinary, struggling diabetics into extraordinary, well-controlled diabetics. If you don't know who I am and you are brand new to this channel, I welcome you. My name is Jay Sapat, and I became an insulin-dependent diabetic a little over six years ago due to an autoimmune attack which caused the destruction of my pancreas as a result of a severe gluten allergy attack. So basically, I am the proud owner of a pancreas that's gone on a permanent and lifelong vacation. So not only am I a diabetic just like you, where we will be walking that walk and talking that talk together, but I do also have a University of Bachelor of Science degree in nutrition dietetics, and that does come in very handy in discussing all the intricacies of being a diabetic. The unique information presented today will only be found here on this channel, The Resilient Diabetic. New, life-changing episodes are released weekly. So if you wanna learn more and you wanna be notified by YouTube that a new video has been published, then the only way to do that is to hit the subscribe button followed by the gray notification bell. Then choose turn on all notifications. And of course, if you liked what you've learned today, you've got to smash that like button for me. As with all my videos, this should not be considered personal medical advice. This is my interpretation of the latest research. If you want medical advice, please always consult your physician. About 75 million American adults have high blood pressure. So that is roughly one in every three adults. But what is absolutely shocking, but even more interesting, approximately 84 million American adults, more than one in three have prediabetes. And 90% of those with prediabetes don't even know they have it yet. Wouldn't you now like to know the common connection between both? High blood pressure is the second biggest known global risk factor for disease. And our stodgy healthcare experts blame one of three main reasons for the explosion of blood pressure. Now, if you've been to your doctor's office, what's the very first thing they do? They'll take your blood pressure and then generally give that first piece of advice. You've got to watch your salt intake. Well, so then it's the salt, right? Or the newer doctors state high blood pressure is simply the aging of the circulatory system as the heart has to pump harder and harder to maintain blood flow through those stiffened arteries. So then it's aging, right? Then the third reason they state you have high blood pressure, they'll blame weight. So the diet speech then ensues. So it's time to lose weight? Well, they are partially right about all three. For example, studies do show that for every 20 pounds you lose, you can drop systolic pressure by 5 to 20 points. No one's really going to argue with that. Regardless of the cause, and in the meantime, the doctors will state, well, we've got to bring that blood pressure down. So the doctors then prescribe blood pressure medications. Science is about asking questions. Does all of this really make a lot of sense? How does weight affect blood pressure physiologically or at the cellular level? How do you account for those with high blood pressure issues who are not old, who are not fat or overweight, or consume high amounts of these highly processed salt-laden foods? So the million dollar question, is it possible that some aspect of diet, if altered, is the true determiner of blood pressure? In order to answer that question, 
which we will today, we will first address the main question. What is the link between diabetes and blood pressure? So let's tackle what science has shown us as the cause of diabetes, and then you will understand the connection. So to begin, we first have to rewind and understand how the human body was fueled and fed prior to the 1900s. One must understand the human body was first designed to move and to be active. It is built, hardwired into our DNA. We move and we were in motion all day long. And that physical activity was expanded to gain and acquire one thing, our food. So basically, one ate accordingly to fuel the body for the whole day. And what types of foods sustain mankind from day one? Nutrient-rich, protein-rich foods. Past generations had to hunt and to gather, or in modern society, they had to walk to work. They had to walk home. They had to tender the farm. They had to physically work throughout the day without any of the modern comforts. What's more, they only ate once to twice a day. Hard manual labor was the cornerstone for mankind from day one. From the second one got up from bed till they went to sleep, they were in motion. Prior generations did not get up, eat that quote unquote healthy bowl of oatmeal, whole breads, milk, juice, all carbohydrates, then get into the car, drive to work, take the elevator up, only then to eat more carbohydrate snacks and drinks, sit in front of the computer for a few hours, get back into the car, and then go have lunch somewhere, eat some more carbohydrates like a sandwich with some kind of chips, carbs, drink, carbs, go back to work, probably have another snack, and then drive home for another heavy carb-laden dinner, sit on the couch, watch a little TV, while eating some more carbohydrates as a snack or dessert. So our healthcare experts out there still promote the excessive carbohydrate consumption, even the healthy ones, in a society that is no longer in motion or is physically active. And if you have not noticed, that also includes our children too. Not only is everything our children are exposed to essentially pure sugar, but they are less active than any other generation. This is our tipping point as a society. So essentially, what is the body to do with all that extra carbohydrates coming in day after day when the body's fuel stores are full because there's no physical activity? And does it matter if those carbohydrates are quote unquote healthy ones like whole grains if one is not using it for direct energy? And this is where the lessons on diabetes begins, regardless of type. Once carbohydrates are consumed in excess, and it does not matter whether it's coming from a can of soda or a bowl of rice or whole grain breads, the body now has to find a place to store it because it's not being used due to inactivity. The body's fuel stores are full. So what does that lead to? Yes, a metabolic disorder called diabetes. And this disorder simply revolves around two things sugars or glucose, and insulin production, as I will now physiologically explain. Glucose is one of the fuels the body can use for energy, and the pancreas produces a hormone called insulin. Insulin drives the glucose from the bloodstream into the cells to be either used directly as immediate energy, or if consumed in excess, to be converted to fats known as triglycerides for future stores. These triglycerides are then stored in a number of locations depending on one's genes. And this is the bomb drop the radical new research has just revealed. The excessive carbs we are eating, both the quote unquote good ones like the whole grains, the starches like sweet potatoes, and even the bad ones like packaged refined carbohydrates and sodas are being converted into these triglycerides by the body's liver and they can be stored in one of two locations. The first is subcutaneously. These are the fats directly underneath the skin that can be seen. These are the fats that can be pinched by your fingers. And ironically, it's the healthy way of fat storage 
that does not cause insulin resistance or much health issues. It just looks unattractive. Just to reiterate, these fats or triglycerides are not coming from the fats we eat, but from the excessive carbohydrates being consumed and then converted by our bodies. In the case of the full-blown type 2 diabetic, fats are now being stored where it cannot be seen, which is inside the liver, deep within the muscle tissues and in between all the body organs, not subcutaneously underneath the skin. This phenomenon explains why many pre-diabetics do not look diabetic. They are not fat or obese in any way. Some are even very skinny. These unseen fats deep inside the body then cause what's known as insulin resistance, meaning the insulin the body produces fails at driving glucose into those cells to be used for energy. Thus, glucose then floats around in higher and higher amounts, damaging the body's nerves and small blood vessels from the inside out. The pancreas then also has to compensate by producing more and more insulin. Thus, you now have high amounts of insulin floating around the blood with a condition called hyperinsulinemia. Clinical studies have shown about 50% of hypertensive individuals have hyperinsulinemia or glucose intolerance, whereas 80% of patients with type 2 diabetes have hypertension. So our high carbohydrate science experiment that we've been running for decades is now coming to fruition. We have gone from eating once or twice a day where the body would get breaks from insulin to now eating five to eight times a day. We now have breakfast and then snacks and then lunch and then snacks and then dinner and then more snacks. And each one of those meals have high amounts of carbohydrates, thus keeping insulin chronically elevated throughout the day. And most importantly, as I've explained in previous episodes, even the healthy carbohydrates our esteemed experts keep suggesting are also the culprits. They want to continually blame junk food. Say you have one large apple for that in-between snack. Once digested and absorbed into the bloodstream, that apple will have the exact same amounts of sugar as in a can of soda. But what is worse, it will also require the same high amounts of insulin levels to cover all those sugars. So now that you're armed with this knowledge, what is the connection to high blood pressure? I'm glad you asked. Well, it all revolves around insulin. Insulin can be both inflammatory and anti-inflammatory at the exact same time, depending on the amounts. In the right amounts, it can exert a vasorelaxation or the relaxation of blood vessels or an anti-inflammatory effect. Whereas in the state of insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia, the high circulating insulin then results in a vasoconstriction or the stiffening or the hardening of the arteries, which then can no longer stretch. But science has taken this a step further and just answered the million dollar question. Where is the real cause of blood pressure issues stemming from? The primary action of insulin on sodium balance is actually exerted on the kidneys. When insulin can no longer bring down blood sugars, the kidneys then sacrifice itself as a final and last resort to protect the rest of the body from the toxic amounts of sugars damaging everything. And it does this through one of two ways. First, it will try and dump out as much of the excessive sugars into the urine. But during that process, the sugars are physically and mechanically tearing apart all those tiny, delicate filtration systems the kidneys possess. The kidneys, through a process of survival, are also reabsorbing all of the sodium in the blood back into the body. What science has just found out is that high circulating insulin sends a signal to the kidneys to hoard sodium. Evidence is accumulating that insulin is a hypertensive factor in humans. The involved mechanism is a sodium retaining effect. High insulin equates to sodium retention, which then in turn creates fluid buildup in the body. All of that fluid 
plus the excess of insulin, which then constricts and stiffens our blood vessels, then adds exponentially to the problem. So what is one of the treatments we are all given when blood pressure issues arrive? Well, lower your salt intake. But as you now know, salt is not really the underlying issue. It is the excessive amounts of insulin. From what? The resistance issues due to excessive amounts of sugars, starches, carbohydrates eaten, both the good and the bad. But on the other side of the equation and due to other genetic conditions which do not involve diet, blood pressure issues are very serious and for many do require medications which do save lives. Your doctor's main job is to treat the condition with medications, not to find a cure for you. That is actually your job. I find it funny how you may be given blood pressure medications that could make your feet swell with edema. Then you're given diuretics or water pills to get rid of that fluid. But the diuretics sometimes cause gout. But don't worry about that. There's medications for the gout too. It's a cycle of madness if you ask me. That diuretic on top of the blood pressure medications may sometimes add fuel to the fire. You could aggravate the condition by making it worse. These diuretics could then cause the body to lose other key electrolytes and potassium, which then create an imbalance, which leads to another host of other health issues. So you can see now, we are not quite solving the problem with medications when the real culprit is sugars and high circulating insulin levels. This is one of the reasons I highly recommend the consumption of above ground, I'll say it again, above ground, non-starchy, cruciferous vegetables as one of your carbohydrate sources. Not only do these vegetables have the least amount of carbs, but also have the highest density of vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants to offset the damaging effects of aging. But most importantly, out of all the carbohydrates consumable, they require the least amounts of insulin. What will be the first thing you notice when you drop your carbs, especially those starchy carbs and those refined carbs? You will start peeing like crazy. It's a natural diuretic effect that will come into play. And for many of us really, really active diabetics, we actually have to add salt back into our diets when insulin levels are kept very low and well controlled. Otherwise, we start to cramp. Once you've made a big step by lowering circulating insulin levels, will your body then start the process of healing itself from both the diabetic complications and the high blood pressure all at the same time? And now you know how and why. To end some of this confusion for you, I will set up a playlist with a multitude of videos that will cover the foods and the carbs I do recommend and why. The carbs that not only keep my A1C test in the low fives, but just importantly, have me using the least amounts of insulin so my blood sugars remain flatlined and controlled. Then that keeps this old diabetic feeling strong and energetic and vibrant all day long. If you're on a desktop or laptop, use that mouse to click that upcoming box. If you're on your mobile device, tap that with your fingers. The first is the link to subscribe to this all important life changing channel. The second, is the link to the playlist I will create for you on the videos just mentioned on foods. So have a great and productive day and we will see you soon with another new episode which I said are always released weekly. Bye for now.